Mysteries of Egypt. When it comes to pensions, don't ask Sharon and Tracy, try Dorian. Birds of a Feather on BBC One after Tomorrow's World. and welcome to the future. And top of the bill in this week's show... For your eyes only, an exclusive preview of a new cash machine. To unlock your bank account, all you've got to do is give it a look. Plus, waging war where you can't see the enemy. Craig Doyle joins the botanical battle to save tropical forests. And will it be the sweet smell of success for this device? It promises to rid the world of malodorous feet. We begin with a Tomorrow's World prediction about to become reality. Three years ago, we featured a system that could uniquely identify people by the pattern of their eyes. It was called the iris scan. Because everyone's eyes are so different, it could instantly distinguish one person from anyone else in the world. Well, as well as the US military, the FBI and the CIA, the banks are interested in iris scan. They want to link this system with credit cards. So, in future, when you use your card in a shop or in a cash machine, something may be looking very deeply into your eyes. Remember that? Well, now it really is happening. Philippa brings us an exclusive preview of how this technology is about to hit the high street. They say that the eye is the window to your soul. From now on, it's also the key to your bank account. This is the first ever cash point in the world to work by iris recognition. With a system like this, you don't need to worry about forgetting your PIN number. You just make eye contact. I still have a card, the same as normal, but no PIN number. So I just select iris recognition. Now I just have to look up at this light. And it's actually taking a good look at my eye. Yes, look, I've been verified. So, um... Cash, please. All from a little bit of eye contact. The father of virus recognition is mathematician John Daugman. He's developed a system for turning the random patterns of the iris into the ideal form of identification. John, it's a fantastic system. How does it work? Well, it's really just um, a lot of mathematics that uh, is involved in encoding these random patterns. So how many features are there in our irises, and how many can we share? There's something like 260 um, mathematically distinguishable characteristics in irises. You can see that several of these have got radial lines, which is a, a common kind of correlation among irises. But there also is structure in other dimensions, and you know, craters and pits and vasculature and so forth. So a bit like fingerprints from mm, that point of yes. view. Yes. Fingerprints have on average about uh, 35 uh, forms of variation, whereas iris patterns have about 266 forms of variation. So <laughs> That means there are many, many more different combinations of features within irises. So can we try it out then? Sure. Just look at the camera over there. Just look at Just the stare camera. in? Yep, that's fine. OK, you're finished now. Oh, done. Already? Yep. You're, you're that's great. All images are grabbed. If you look on the screen here, you'll see that each of these frames that we grab is being analyzed, first to localize the eye, and then a lot of mathematical processing goes on. So this is this when it turns the patterns of my eye into maths. Exactly. By analyzing all the texture in the iris, we compute an iris code, which is sort of a personal barcode right. for that eye. Right. So that's the theory. Now it's being tried in a commercial environment. And these three customers have been given the first accounts using iris recognition. But will the customers feel comfortable in trusting their money to a glance? So you've all had a chance to try it. What do you think? I think uh, 
the first thing that struck me about it really is how remarkably simple it is. There's no flash or anything like that. It took, I suppose, a total of about 30 seconds to register. Good. Betty, what did you think? Yes, it was really easy when we got to the cash machine. Uh, just look up at the light until it finished flashing and same as a normal cash machine after that. And Natalie, how did you feel? Yeah, I think it's a really easy process. You don't have to remember your PIN number or anything. And it's really quick to register. So there might be one problem, which might be security. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm told the eye is uh, unique to the individual, so there really shouldn't be a problem. And you shouldn't need to keep PIN numbers uh, on yourself anymore or have to try to remember them. So uh, I don't really see a problem. So in that case, you won't mind if I try with your card then? <laughs> you can have a go if you like. How much is in there? You find out. <laughs> so I am now a fraud, because this is not my card. Let's see if I get away with it, then. Sorry, it has not been possible to use iris recognition. There you are. It's got me spotted, you see. And the makers tell us that there is absolutely no chance of anyone else's iris matching your own. And don't even think about using a photograph of someone. The system can tell whether the pupil is reacting as in a living eye. And because every iris is unique, Dr Daugman says you don't actually need a card. Just looking into the cash machine will be enough to identify you. But getting your money is just the beginning. Anywhere that we use keys and, and cards or passwords or PIN numbers, Keys are basically Bronze Age artifacts. They go back 5,500 years. Why are we still carrying them around in our pockets? This is more convenient and far more reliable. Well, that eye scan will be on trial at a branch in Swindon for the next six months. If it works well, we could all be making eyes at our cash points in a couple of years' time. Now, the buds are bursting, the birds are singing, the lawn is growing at a rate of knots, and even Jez Nelson has a spring in his step. Time for a seasonal road test. Hello, Tomorrow's World Research Desk. Hi, Sally. It's Jez. Oh, hi there. Listen, I am itching to get back out on the road, so I was just wondering, what gadgets have you got for me today? Oh, yes. I was just about to give you a call. Well, it's in at the deep end for you with a new material called thermofluid, which could make it safer in the water. Excellent. So what do you think? This is my new extruded polyethylene suit and not only does it float but it's also incredibly thin and light and very warm. And this is Adrian from the British Canoe Union. Adrian, is this the kind of life jacket that you'd normally wear whether in a swimming pool practicing or in choppy rivers? Um, it is. The um, problem with it, it can tend to be uh, bulky and quite restrictive in your movement. Are you prepared to swap that for a free trial of my new jacket? I'll give it a go. All right. So. The manufacturers say that the reason this is going to keep you afloat and warm is because all the thousands of little holes inside this material is about 10 layers of that inside. Okay, right, so you prepared? Jump. Ooh. It certainly works straight to the surface. What do you reckon, Adrian? Yeah, it's got me to the surface and I might just swap it for mine. I don't think I actually need the trousers, it's just it's really keeping me afloat. It's quite, quite relaxing actually. Hello. Hi Jess, don't bother going anywhere because the next gadget's waiting for you inside. Okay. When summer finally comes, I want you to smell as fresh as daisies. Poor. We all know the problem, stinky trainers. Now, of course, before you go for a run, you can give a little spray of deodorant, but to be honest, although it works at first, it tends to wear off very quickly. Now, it's bad enough for an amateur like me, but Ben, you're a professional gym trainer. Must be a nightmare for you. Have you got stinky feet? <laughs> I've got very stinky feet, yeah. I mean, I wear my trainers pretty much all day, every day. And after a while, as you can imagine, the smell's quite horrendous. Well, I could have the answer to your prayers here because an inventor has come up with these anti-stench trainers. Now, every training shoe has a cavity in the heel. And what the inventor's done is to fill that cavity with deodorant. So before you go for a run, you just uh, give yourself a little boost of deodorant in the heel there. Let me fill you up. There you go. And now we should be ready to go and uh, do some heavy exercise. 
and our feet will smell like roses. Okay. Let's go. Every time your heel hits the ground, it creates a vacuum and pulls the deodorant up from the cavity through the sole of the trainer and into your sock. And there's a one-way valve, so the deodorant can't be forced back out through the hole. And uh, my feet feel very fresh, actually. I'm completely pooped. Well, that was just 30 minutes of exercise, but we've got a good sweat up. But uh, how are your feet, Ben? They actually feel quite dry. Yeah? Yeah. OK, well, let's put it to the uh, real test and uh, give these things a sniff. Hmm, not a bad little bouquet. Quite, quite fresh. fresh. Yeah, not Very bad. fresh. Not you bad. impressed, are you? Not too bad. As I say, you have to give it a little bit longer, I think, to tell. But anything that helps make my trainers last a little bit longer can't be a bad thing. Hello? Oh, Jez, don't put your feet up just yet. Oh, no. I need you to do some gardening. But don't worry, you'll be able to sit back and relax during this one. Because it may just be every gardener's dream come true. Pretty high on the list of chores that most of us wish we could hand over to a robot is cutting the grass. Now, techies have been claiming for years that they've come up with the automatic mower, and uh, this is the latest attempt. It's called the Robo Mow, and the inventors of this claim that it will cut your grass in nice straight lines, even when you're away on your holidays, and even on a nasty British wet day. With the, with, with the grass because it's not collecting it and in fact it just seems to be squashing the grass down at the moment it's a, a bit of a nasty day isn't it? <clears throat> it's a dedicated mulcher so it chops the grass into very tiny little pieces which are fed back into the lawn all right now we've seen quite a few of these automatic mowers on tomorrow's world over the years what's so different about this one well on this particular model next year you can actually have its own docking station where it will finish all this work rather like weather like today we can wander in the machine will then go back and physically dock itself charge itself up and then come out once a week twice a week even when you're on holiday okay well if that's all right on its own i can think of a better place to watch it from well that's our springtime for you although a future with those type of gadgets does look rather rosy Thermafloat has just been given the Design Council seal of approval, a Millennium Product Award. And its makers have had a lot of interest from the top names in sports clothing. So it should be lining jackets like this in the shops later this year. Still to come, the marauding plant that's already destroyed most of Tahiti's forests and is now invading Hawaii. Craig Doyle reports on how science is helping the islanders to fight back. And 21st century justice, Singapore style. In a high-tech world, the computer holds court. Now for an update. Last year, we met Lisa Cowley, an expectant mother with a history of preterm birth. Having already had two dangerously premature babies, Lisa ran a serious risk of her third child being born even earlier. Doctors feared she might lose the baby altogether. Lisa was taking part in the trials of an experimental new treatment for preterm labour, a drug called misulide, which acts against the hormones which trigger labour. Lisa Cowley is all too familiar with the heartache of preterm birth. Both her daughters were born early. The youngest, Georgia, spent two and a half months in an incubator. She literally fought for her life every single day. I mean, instantly she was put on morphine. It was like looking at a dead baby because she was lifeless. I mean, it really, really was horrific. Here we can see the baby moving about. It's the baby's head and uh, body. Given her medical history, it's very likely that Lisa will go into labour early again. So as the pregnancy goes on, there's an ever-increasing risk of her going into labour dangerously early. Professor Bennett has decided to give her the new drug to prevent this happening. Um, we'll probably treat her with nimesulide from about 26 to 28 weeks in order to get her through that very uh, important and critical 26 to 32 week period. So what are your hopes for this drug? Well, hopefully if it just gives me a few more weeks, it just buys me some time, that's everything. 
Well, that was five months ago, and Lisa has had a baby boy. The really good news is that she managed to hold on to the pregnancy to term. Here he is at home with Lisa and family. His name's Max, and he's now 10 weeks old. As you can see, both mum and baby are doing well. We're all delighted here. Congratulations to the family and to the team at Queen Charlotte's. Doctors hope that nimizulide will be more successful and have fewer side effects than existing drugs. It's still undergoing clinical trials, but given this latest success story, Professor Bennett and the team at Charlotte's are optimistic about the future of this new treatment. Now, you might think that buying a plant abroad and bringing it home because you like the look of it, a harmless enough act, but not so. That's exactly what one person did in Hawaii. And now the country's forests are threatened with destruction by what's turned out to be a rampaging pest. The big problem for the Hawaiians is stopping the plant in its tracks, and that means spotting it in time. Craig Doyle reports on how science is helping the islanders to spot the intruder. In stunning contrast to the traditional images of Hawaii, sun, surf and sand are the rainforests of Maui. Covering a vast area of the islands, they're packed with native plants. But there's an imposter amongst us. This is my conia. It shouldn't be here, but it loves it here and it breeds like wildfire. It could take over this whole area in a matter of years. And that's no exaggeration. Myconia, a native of Peru, has already taken hold on the island of Tahiti and destroyed 70% of the rainforest there. It's no problem in its natural habitat, but in Hawaii, it's crowding out the other plants. This is the center of the Maui rainforest. Now, it's quite dark and damp in here, but the Myconia is rife. And that's the terrifying thing about this plant, the speed in which it spreads. Each one of these little pods has 100 Myconia seeds in it. So the Hawaiians have decided to act before the spread of Myconia gets any worse. Bob Hobdy is leader of a team with a mission to seek out and destroy the alien. So how did Myconia actually get here? Well, it was brought in by a nurseryman who thought the plant was beautiful and these plants were all contained within one garden here not too long ago. Today, we have about 2,500 acres. Incredibly, Myconia could even jeopardize the island's water supply. The rainforest acts as a collection point for water, feeding it into underground reservoirs. Myconia disrupts this. Its shallow roots aren't very good at holding the soil together, so when it rains, the water runs off instead of soaking through to the reservoirs. A disaster for islanders and plants alike. So, it's vital that Bob and his team find and destroy every Myconia plant. As you can see, this is a very thick jungle here and uh, it's hard to get through. The terrain's very rough underneath the vegetation and uh, men on the ground just have a difficult time finding these things. So we really do need to spot these from the air. And that's just what scientist Jonathan Grady is doing. We're trying to develop ways of using remote sensing, that is using aerial imagery or even space-based imagery, to find Myconia in the rainforest. But every plant looks green. It's very hard uh, for me to tell them apart. How does your camera manage to do that? Our camera can see in colors that you and I can't see. Every plant has a special signature called a spectral fingerprint or color fingerprint. What our machine does is to identify the Myconia fingerprint relative to all the other plants that are out there. So it's time to head to the airport and get the camera loaded. Now, Jonathan, the first thing that strikes me, you have an airplane, why can't you just look out the window and spot the Myconia? We'll be flying quite high, and we want to do more than just spot large clumps of Myconia. We're looking for the individual leaf that's beginning to break through the canopy. Okay, I take it the spectrometer here has a lot to do with it. Yes, this is a multispectral digital camera, and you'll notice the colored filters in each lens here. These are specific to the Myconia that we're after. So we'll be able to take pictures, digital pictures, move them to our computer, and then process them in the, process them in the lab later. The camera filters out the light reflected from every other plant except Myconia, so the only image it picks up is of the green invader. Once we 
have the data stored in the computer, we'll go back to the lab and process the images so that we can make sense and make a map of the, uh, of the Myconia area. The computer analyzes the data to show the lie of the land and then pinpoints the position of Myconia, with every red dot representing a single Myconia leaf. I took the finished map out to Bob, who was waiting with his team on the edge of the rainforest. We've been waiting for these. We've got some stuff up in this upper corner here that we didn't know we had before. Thank right, you. I'll let you get to it. All right. Without further ado, they prepare for battle. Surprisingly, while high-tech equipment finds the Myconia, the best way to get rid of it is with good old-fashioned blood, sweat and tears. The crew travel deep into the forest before they find this latest outbreak. A place they'd never have come across without the map. So Bob, this is the Myconia we saw on the map then, isn't it? Yeah, this is the place. Boy, there's plenty of it here too. First, it's out with the knives to cut down all visible Myconia plants before they can drop seeds and spread any further. Once a plant is cut, they spray the remaining stump with a coloured pesticide. While this technique looks haphazard, it's the only way to combat such a widespread infestation. The mountain is huge and this technique can cover those thousands of acres and show us these populations just real quickly. So, bearing in mind the mapping and the spraying and, and, and the way you clear it, do you think you can beat Myconia? We have a chance, but it's not going to be easy. Well, as we know, it's not just the Hawaiians who are being invaded by foreign plant species. We've got our very own colonisation problem here at home. And here to talk about it is Pippa Greenwood from Gardener's World. Welcome. Hi. So, what alien species are a problem in Britain then? Well, there are several things. I think probably one of the, the best known and most feared is Rhododendron ponticum, mm -hmm. which is yeah, a, a wild form of Rhododendron. In fact, it was native in this country before the last Ice Age. But since then, it's been reintroduced as initially as a garden plant sort of Victorian era and it's really invading natural woodland and wild areas of Britain mm -hmm. it's very aggressive it grows I mean it's just a small branch from it but yeah. at great rates it spreads by seed and it spreads with root fragments so it gets everywhere I've got another baddie here <laughs> yeah Japanese knotweed that's something a lot of people have come across in wasteland and even in gardens now it's becoming quite a problem it grows at a phenomenal rate again it, it's herbaceous so it dies down at the end of the season but it comes up producing stems maybe six eight foot or more just in a single season and there's a long and dense root system as well so how about in our gardens then well things like this looks innocent you might buy it in a garden center it's called mind your own business it's lovely or health scene and it looks great but it spreads very very fast so this is the sort of thing that i would say could potentially be an invader of the future if you like right well pippa what should we do about these kind of things well, things like the rhododendron are actually being officially dealt with, as is the Japanese knotweed. There are restrictions on moving them, planting them, and there are actually national campaigns to control them. Things like this really are down to using garden weed killers. And a bit of elbow grease. A lot of elbow grease. Pippa okay, Greenwood, thank you very much. Now, why do we have to make our law courts look like a scene from a comic opera? All those wigs and guns and piles of paper clogging up the desk. The fact is, justice doesn't have to be dressed up in such ancient trappings, and Jez Nelson reports from one country, Singapore, where, whatever some people may say about their controversially hard-line justice system, one thing's for sure, they're certainly cutting a swathe through the paperwork. Singapore has been independent since 1965, but its legal system, like the Supreme Court building behind me, dates back to the British occupation. On the surface, it looks the very picture of tradition, but underneath, there are big changes going on. Justice is going high-tech, where once there were quilled pens, there are now computers, modems and megabytes. A world where a sentence may be handed out at the click of a mouse. 
This is the judge's desk. I'm sure it's the only time I'm going to get to sit in this part of the court. And uh, he has up here uh, a computer and a terminal, but the lawyers have access to all of the same information. What kind of information do they have at their fingertips? Well, um, lawyers can bring in their own diskets or their own CD-ROMs with whatever information they wish to put into it and call up for this information. For instance, um, there may be information on the opening statements, their own documents, um, as in this case, there is information on the charge sheet right, for a case of drug trafficking. It may also contain information of uh, maps, like a road directory here. And there you have it. Everything is in there. And the technology means the physical evidence is instantly accessible to the whole court. Digital recordings are made of everything that's said. And if a witness can't get to the court, they can give evidence by two-way video link with a multi-camera view of the courtroom. The technology court is only one of the major changes happening in the legal system here. Every year, Singapore's lawyers, judges and clerks produce seven million individual pieces of paper. But now the Singapore judiciary aims to become totally paperless, doing away with the mountains of files blocking up lawyers' offices. Within the next few years, every legal transaction in Singapore will be done electronically. Using a system called LawNet, lawyers will be able to send and receive documents from court, access research, and even, crucially for them, work out their costs online. Leslie Chu, a partner at one of Singapore's biggest firms, is moving from this to this. We sometimes deal with documents for filing in court in very large numbers. I mean, a standard affidavit for a big case might run into four or five hundred pages. Now that sort of thing, if it's reduced to electronic form, is certainly much more convenient and less cumbersome. Like most computer systems, this doesn't look too exciting, but it really could revolutionise the way the legal system works. You can create a document here, say a writ, which can't be tampered with, and then send it to the court electronically, and within half an hour, it'll be back with you with the court's seal of approval. That confirms that the writ has been issued. Even if there are no staff in the registry of the High Court, so long as the computers can accept documents, you can actually file. If properly organised, uh, time is not necessarily a constraint. The advantages of an electronic system are clear, but there are still concerns about security. Leslie Chu is optimistic about the future, though, and can see a day when all the lawyers of the world are linked up together online. The good thing about uh, computers and computer people is they speak the same electronic language. A megahertz is a megahertz everywhere. That's not necessarily so with lawyers, because they do have uh, national boundaries and things like that. So I, I, I really think it can be done. Well, British courts may look old-fashioned, but cyber justice may be just around the corner here too. The Lord Chancellor is said to be keen on the idea, and a recent fraud trial in Kingston, BT installed computer screens to present prosecution evidence, slashing the amount of paperwork in court and dramatically speeding up the case. Right, well, that's all for this week, but make sure you tune in next week for another World First from Philippa. A trip into a new realm of the senses. Soon you'll be able to immerse yourself completely in virtual reality. And we report on what claims to be the biggest breakthrough in dental care for a century. We'll fill you in next week. See you then. Bye. <laughs>